The way you act in the current moment when you had experienced childhood trauma in the past can be very similar to the way ADHD symptoms are manifested. And in this video exactly, I'm going to talk about those similarities in behavior, which is important topic because sometimes it can be very confusing to differentiate what is going on and without understanding what's going on, treatment can be inefficient because, for example, with a person with ADHD, sometimes having too large coffees can calm you down and can help you focus. In the meantime, a person with childhood trauma who gets triggered by something in their environment and they respond in flight, fight, or freeze mode, those people will not benefit at all, no matter how much coffee you give them. I know it's a simplified example, but I think you got the point. Trauma responses are usually triggered by association between the here and now and the past experience. The amygdala, called the smoke alarm of the brain, becomes hyperactive after trauma. This highlighted sensitivity means that small triggers, such as changing someone's tone, a loud noise, or seeing someone who resembles a person linked to your trauma, any of this can cause an intense reaction, as if you're being attacked again. In that sense, childhood who trauma is external somebody did something to you at some point in your life and this is why you behave in xyz manner and these external events shape your coping mechanisms in a way that can very often resemble adhd symptoms adhd symptoms do not require association between the current situation and the traumatic experience because there is no need for traumatic experience in order to have adhd the thing with adhd is that your own brain is wired differently there are neurological structural differences that cause you to behave in XYZ manner. The amygdala plays a role here as well. But while ADHD is also associated with increased reactivity, it is due to those differences in neurological pathways and it isn't necessarily linked to past trauma. One common thing between ADHD and trauma is the impact on memory and emotional regulation. After trauma, the hippocampus, which is a brain area that is responsible for processing memories and emotions, actually shrinks. This damage makes it difficult for you to process emotions as they come and differentiate between the present and the past moment, which consequently means that you can experience the traumatic event completely. You can feel the whole thing again in the here and now as if it's happening right now. And again, because of the shrinkage of the hippocampus, it is a bit more difficult for you to regulate the intensity of the emotions, which is why to an observer, you can seem like you're acting crazy in the moment. And even you, later on, when you are sobered up from the trigger, you can look back at your behavior and be like, why did I react with such intensity? ADHD is also associated with memory issues, particularly working memory. This is, for example, when you had an idea what to do and then you go to execute it. But the moment you enter the room, you completely forgot what you had in mind. Or you're getting introduced to somebody and the moment they tell you their name, you completely forget what was said and you need a couple of times this name to be repeated to, to eventually remember it. Well, as much as these memory issues might seem similar, the background is completely different. In ADHD, it's about paying attention and overall struggles with executive functions that we'll talk about in a minute. Oh, and in the meantime, I gotta show you something. This is how my cat looks at me while I'm doing this. Like, how can you focus if you are having this audience? And now back to our topic. So ADHD is very often linked to emotional dysregulation. However, the background story here is usually this balance in neurotransmitters. At least that's our current understanding. And more specifically, there are four neurotransmitters that are involved in ADHD. And now I'm thinking that this also could be a nice video. So if you are interested, leave me a comment. Probably I'll need to be a lot more focused for that. But today was a day that I either filmed this the way you are seeing it now or don't film at all. And I talk so much about how to actually get things done even though you have ADHD. So here is reality check. Sometimes we struggle and we cut it out of the video, but this time I decided to keep it real. Another brain area that suffers due to the experience of trauma is the prefrontal cortex, which is like the CEO of your brain. This is the area where most of the executive functions happens planning, critical thinking, decision-making, 
prefrontal cortex. This combination of overly active amygdala, meaning your smoke alarm in your brain sounds off way too easily, way too frequently, together with the shrinkage of the prefrontal cortex, meaning you have difficulties processing information, processing emotions and memory and regulating them into more critical and more logical decisions that make sense to your environment. All this put together is how triggers look like. And this is one of the main reasons why people who have experienced trauma struggle with acting accordingly to the situation. This is the root cause of the problem, at least on biological level, with according to our current understanding of neuroscience, which is always under development. Just a little side note, because the researcher in me is kind of like, ah, well, you're talking with this certainly, but we never know for sure what we will know in 20 years from now, for example. So far, this is how we understand trauma response. This function in the prefrontal cortex is probably one of the easiest ways to even explain ADHD. The current understanding now is that not enough or not consistently enough supply of dopamine into your prefrontal cortex leads to underactive prefrontal cortex. Therefore, you have issues planning, impulse control, or sustained attention. So of course, in that sense, decision-making will be difficult because your brain is not functioning optimally in order to make the best possible decision given the information at the time. Now I'm going to give you five examples of specific behavior manifestations that at first glance seem so similar, it's almost impossible to distinguish between ADHD and trauma, but when you look a little deeper, you can see the differences. And I hope this can help you understand whether you are closer to ADHD or to trauma, because once again, understanding yourself better can help you react to the problem a bit more accurately. The key difference between trauma and ADHD is that with trauma, we have the presence of an abuse story. Something happened at some point in your life that caused this behavior. And I think showing a Venn diagram can actually be useful here for those of you who are visual learners like me. So let's try this. Both trauma and ADHD can manifest in difficulty focusing, low frustration tolerance, interrupted sleep, disorganization, disassociation, verbal communication problems, low self-esteem, forgetfulness, feelings of shame and guilt. Emotional delay is one typical behavioral manifestation that can look so similar in both issues. For example, somebody asked you to do something and in the moment you were kind of numb. You, you didn't have any emotion towards the request. You said yes. But then the closer you get to uh, execution, what you agreed to, the more you start feeling emotions and oftentimes you don't want to do the thing at all because now you have all those negative emotions and you're like, how the heck did I not respond in the first place, but I'm responding now? Well, one explanation could be that you had experienced childhood trauma, which means as a child, you learn to survive in situations that are out of your control. And how do you survive something that is hurting you and you cannot stop? You dissociate from it. You become numb. So whatever is happening, you try not to have emotional response towards it. But also as a child, you learn to be hyper vigilant towards people because, again, you want to protect yourself. You want to know to anticipate the threat before it hurts you. So sometimes what happens is in the moment you are numb. That's your shield. That's your protection. Later on, your brain kicks in trying to protect you and starts looking back at this person and at the request and thinks, mm, are they trying to manipulate me? Are they trying to take advantage of me? Is there a threat I didn't see at first, but maybe I can see now that I'm calmer and away from the situation? And you get over this thinking again with the learned protection mechanism that people are there to hurt you. And that's why later on you start feeling negatively towards a request because you think maybe you have been taken advantage of. In ADHD, emotional processing can also seem delayed, but again, it's because of difficulties paying attention and processing information on the spot. So for example, sometimes people talk to you, but you don't really process that auditory information. So of course you cannot much react to it. You will react later, which again, has nothing to do with the hypervigilance or fear of criticism. It has to do with your brain. However, you also learn that sometimes you don't process emotions and information 
correctly and on the spot. So over time, people with ADHD start to overthink. Hmm, did I react okay to that? Did I actually, again, was taken advantage of? Were they trying to manipulate me? All this overthinking happens because you learn that you have this delay in processing information and emotions. So it's kind of like self-caused coping mechanism. Being constantly in a hurry could also stem from trauma or ADHD. In trauma, it's more about avoiding the criticism. You are used to having this judgment of others no matter what you do. So if you are constantly onto another project and you're never too long staying in the same situation, in the same relationship, in the same job, in the same country, then in a way others don't even have time to process what's happening with you and criticize it. Also, if you constantly seem busy, thanks capitalism, you're kind of productive. Even if you're not doing the best and people still find flaws in what you're doing, at least you're productive, you're busy, you're ambitious, and that is usually seen as the good behavior. So you're trying to behave. Being constantly in a hurry for people with ADHD, it looks like high Activity. It's a very common symptom, unless you have inattentive ADHD, which is a completely different topic. But nevertheless, the hyperactivity in people with ADHD is due to your restless mind. You need constant stimulation and you struggle to stay still for long periods of time. That's it. No fear of criticism that drives the hyperactivity. Feeling fatigue can trigger you to also feel sad and in trauma response, this is because most likely as a child experiencing childhood trauma, you actually sort of lived through a childhood depression. It's very likely that indeed you are having this normalized depression in you. And when you're finally not busy and finally tired, you're facing your feelings, you're facing how you truly feel. And then you're realizing how sad you are, how much unresolved trauma there is in you. And that makes you feel so sad. So in a way, every single time when the weekend comes after a very long, busy week, you're sulking into your feelings, not because you are lazy. It's just because finally you have the time to process it. And because it's been happening for so many years, you're not truly processing it because you've normalized the depression. You're just struggling with it. You're suffering it. In ADHD, fatigue can be tied to task paralysis. And here it can be also very confusing for the person because there is this inner dialogue and inner criticism. Am I allowed to be tired? Am I legitimately tired right now? Or am I experiencing task paralysis? And task paralysis is simplified, not enough dopamine in your prefrontal cortex in order for your brain to function properly. It's like trying to drive on an empty tank. It's not going to work. So yeah, task paralysis is quite neurological. Whereas feeling tired after exhausting all your focus and attention for a couple of days, probably not sleeping enough. Yes, of course, it will make sense. But for the person experiencing it, it can be very difficult sometimes to draw the line and to evaluate whether it is fatigue or it's task paralysis. And either way, it can trigger you feeling sad because if you are sitting on the couch, unable to can, then yeah, first of all, you criticize yourself. And second of all, you just feel useless and it's a sad feeling. For people with trauma to freeze under pressure, it's probably one of the most obvious coping mechanisms. And it stems from the fact that as a child, if you were neglected from your parents, think about this. When was the time you actually received attention? When was the time they finally looked at you and finally were talking to you when they didn't like what you did, when they wanted to criticize you, when there were fingers pointed at you, when there was blame towards you? So you basically associate receiving attention, being in the spot of the attention with criticism. This is the time when people are finally there to tell you everything they dislike about you. So of course, from this experience, when you grow up, you have an absolute panic towards public speech because at that point, you feel the trigger and you expect that everybody in the audience hates you. And the moment you stop talking, they're going to start raising negative questions or comments towards you because 
because that is the only experience you have. That is the only association you have. People with ADHD can also freeze under pressure, but here the most common reasons are A, you are being easily distracted. So when you're under pressure, you have to, let's say, present. You are easily distracted by your audience, which makes it very difficult to, one, raise the thoughts in your head and try to compete with the alternative desires and ideas in order to deliver the story you would like to deliver. And at the same time, seeing all those people and how they move and how they even react to you. All of this can be so distracting, which can lead you to freeze. Or the second reason is that you're overly stimulated. There's just so much to process that you block. Given the previous example, I think the example of procrastination will make a lot of sense. If you grew up in unsupportive, hostile environment, then most likely one of your parents was criticizing your behavior no matter what. Let's give a small example. Let's say you had to uh, do your homework and one of your parents was actually checking your homework, but let's say they hated your handwriting. So no matter how much effort you put into it, no matter the different uh, subject or your knowledge or your actual performance, this person just hated the way you write. So they would have criticized your homework nevertheless. So if you learn this, then what would be the coping mechanism to avoid the pain and the hurt? You would avoid doing your homework because you know the moment you finish your homework, they will check it and the criticism will follow. So in a way, you learn to procrastinate as a way to avoid criticism. So there is also a link to perfectionism because of that. You just know that you are not enough, your effort is not that good, you're underperforming, and you will be criticized for that. So why the heck would you have the motivation to get anything done with this anticipation of outcome? Of course you would procrastinate. Procrastination in ADHD is probably one of the most common symptoms, but here the reason is mostly, again, due to your prefrontal cortex. More specifically, you procrastinate for two main reasons. Task initiation. Those first five minutes for somebody with ADHD they are indeed the most difficult thing. Starting something, having the executive function to become active can be really difficult. And the second reason for procrastination, most common in people with ADHD, is time management. You have to get ready to go somewhere, for example. You are going to underestimate how much time you need to get ready. So you're going to give yourself 10 minutes when indeed you need 30 minutes. Now, after discussing all this negative and difficult experience, I think it's fair and needed to mention something positive, like a light in the tunnel, and this is neuroplasticity. You have access to rewiring your brain, to changing the pathways in your brain. It is difficult, but also think about it. The childhood trauma you have experienced and shaped your brain and your responses in a way had been there for years, right? It wasn't a week of your parents fighting. It wasn't one time your parents said something. It has been consistent torture over years. So of course, it will take time to rewire. And I'm telling you this to remind you to be a bit kinder and more compassionate to yourself when you want to change your behavior. It will take time because the current negative behavior took time to be shaped in that way. So give yourself more than a couple of weeks in order to change something. While ADHD is not exactly healed in the same way, current understanding is that you cannot just rewire your brain. And I completely agree with this. I don't think that's going to ever change. It is still possible to benefit from neuroplasticity because through behavior therapy, mindfulness practices, structural routines that you may not like, you can actually rewire those pathways and make it a bit more easily for you to follow a pathway that you would like to follow once you build it. So overall, the manifestation of trauma, the consequences of having trauma and the symptoms of ADHD can be so similar and confusing for the individual, even for those around them. But understanding the difference is so important. As I said at the beginning, you can sometimes soften, mitigate the symptoms of ADHD with stimulants, but this is not going to work for people with childhood trauma. A little bit of self-reflection can help you even when you are going to a professional guidelines. And I highly recommend you do not take any video on the internet to diagnose 
knows yourself. Take it as education and increasing your self-awareness, which then can help even the specialist you're working with. Because if you are experiencing, for example, symptoms that seem like childhood trauma, then you can go and talk to a therapist. Hey, this is how my childhood looked like. This is what I'm doing now. Let's talk about it and let's see if I'm actually experiencing this or maybe I'm having ADHD. The more information you provide, the, the more accurate the diagnosis is. It's, it's a teamwork with the right specialist. Usually it's a teamwork. Either way, thanks for watching guys and I hope this brought some clarity and helped you somehow and I'm gonna see you in the next video. Bye!